Welcome to the Odyssey Podcasts. This is Jean Cavellos, Director of Odyssey. Odyssey is an intensive six-week workshop for writers of fantasy, science fiction, and horror whose work is approaching publication quality. Odyssey is held each summer on the campus of St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire. Adult writers from all over the world apply. Only 16 are admitted. Top authors, editors, and agents serve as guest lecturers. For more information, visit www.odysseyworkshop.org. Podcast number five is an excerpt from a lecture Melissa Scott gave at Odyssey in the summer of 2003 on world building. The text of this recording is copyright 2003 by Melissa Scott. The sound recording is copyright 2007 by Odyssey Writing Workshops. I'm here to talk about world building, um, which is for me, one of the really fun parts of working on a novel. The first thing that I think you start with in any science fiction story, and I'm going to talk primarily about science fiction because it's what I know best, though I think what I say applies to fantasy pretty much in the same ways, um, and to horror to, with some, with some minor modifications. With science fiction, you start with a what if. There's that core idea that sits at the center of the story, you know. And in terms of world building, that really sets your parameters. What you want to talk about sets up how you're going to build your world. And rather than thinking of it as restricting you, I think of it as sort of setting boundaries. It allows certain ideas, it probably excludes others. If you want to write about far-flung intergalactic uh, civilizations, that implies immediately that you have an F, uh, some kind of faster than light travel. It can be done with slower than light, but that particular choice, I want to write about a galactic civil, multi-planet galactic, intergalactic civilization, <coughs> sets um, boundaries. You're unlikely to want to put that story, for example, on one particular, on only one planet, or concern yourself only with one planet. Even Dune, which is kind of the classic one, moves around, moves to other worlds. And that brings me sort of to the idea, to physical settings. Um, kind of got a checklist of things that I always try to think about um, when I'm starting with an idea, and the first one is simply the physical laws. With science fiction, that's obviously crucial. What kind of physics are you playing with? What kind of biology? With fantasy, I find it's just as crucial to know what kind of magic. Is it the big power from the skies magic that you see in a lot of quest fantasies? Is it the ceremonial magic that you see in other kinds of stories? Is it the little magic? All of which you know, changes the feeling of the story. Either, su and either supports your what if or plays against it. And the other corollary to that is even if your characters don't know how things work, you'd better know. In fact, it's even more important that you know the details if your characters don't. Another thing to consider is how big is your world going to be? I don't just mean physically, although that's part of it, but how much space is the story concerned with? Are you restricting it to a city, a planet, multiple planets? What kind of a universe, what kind of space do your characters have to concern themselves with? The corollary to that is how big is your character's world? Within this overall conception, how much of it do your characters actually know? Same thing is the idea of a dominant physical feature. Lots and lots of science fiction writers play with that. Um, Dune again being the classic example. You have the single, the desert planet, or John Vinge's Outcast of Heaven Belt, where the unavoidable dominant physical feature is that all the characters live in an asteroid belt. And everything is related not by distance per se, but by the time it takes to get from one place to another which is constantly changing as the asteroids move in relation to each other. And, you know, that sounds really small, but that changes how you think about absolutely everything. 
I tend to think personally of sort of, of the idea of dominant physical feature as what can't your characters avoid dealing with? In Kindly Wins, which I talked about last night, it was the 72-hour day-night. The uh, social conflict in that book involved um, a legal system that issued capital punishment for, uh, instead of social death, um, if you offend against a fairly strict social code, you're declared dead and nobody talks to you anymore. Nobody acknowledges your existence. And it being a planet in a good deal of social turmoil, there were an awful lot of legal ghosts and people who'd um, official, there was also a way you could opt out of the social system. And those people lived, the ghosts, all of whom were perfectly alive, lived and were active during the 72-hour 72, 72 night and during the eclipse in the middle of the day. So there was this rhythm of how the society worked that had to do with the planetary system. That also segues into the question of time. A big function in um, Kindly Ones was the day-night cycle. And I actually ended up doing a huge set of charts for the entire book you know, when was it day, when was it night, when did the eclipse happen, so that the entire book could be charted out on the big calendar. Clocks and calendars, you know, for one obvious reason, you're not going to find, or it's going to be very rare that you find a planet with a 24-hour day and a 365 and a quarter day year. Just changing that, yeah. one, it makes it look science fictional. It makes yeah, at a very simple level, it makes it look like science fiction. On the more profound level, as with kindly ones, when you start working out ramifications, you get some neat stuff. I mean, what does it feel like if you, if day, if day and night last four hours? If you're on a planet with a very fast rotation, what does it do to the weather? You know, all these other things that you can build on. And. This is one of the places, as I said earlier, I would encourage you never to reject anything too quickly because things that look incredibly inconvenient can sometimes be really fun. Along with that comes the question of climate. How cold is it? How hot is it? What do seasons look like? And I am personally fond of weather as a sort of background um, well, as an atmosphere, literally. It's an effect that I find visually striking and that I think readers pick up on. It's not something that is so weird and alien that you have to think about too much. Everybody lives in weather. But it's something where you can really create a mood, create a setting, really reinforce the story that you're trying to tell. Um, and it's worth considering what kind of weird seasons you would have. Um, growing up in Arkansas, March is spring. Moving to New England, I have been, I've lived here since the 70s, and every March I am disappointed that it's not yet spring. <laughs> but bearing in mind how people see the cycle of the year is a really useful way to make sure that you're not just imposing the now on an alien place. And I think that's almost as much true in, in fantasy as in science fiction, figuring out how the year runs, particularly when you're dealing with the kind of archetypical fiction that you see in really good fantasy. And you may notice that I'm kind of working my way down a decision tree. Each of the things that I've talked about influences the next question, influences the next question. Once you have climate, you run into dominant flora and fauna. From f flora and fauna, you move to the food chain. And it's always worth noting where your characters sit on the food chain. Being, as I mentioned, courtship right. Um, being a potential food animal until you reach the age of five also rather affects all your characters. Another, this is, this is kind of a bridge question as it leads into the social setting, is the question of transportation. How do you get there from here? I mentioned 
the idea of multiple planets does imply some kind of space drive or some way of getting there. And as soon as you make a choice, it excludes other choices, permits different ones. And being aware of that chain is really important. It's also important, as I said, to be willing to change things, revise things. Because I enjoy the play part and because I feel that it gives you a lot more options, a lot more chances to add depth to a story, I encourage you to try it. To every so often just turn everything upside down and look at what you got. See if, see if changing something would actually help. And that goes for, the social, for social settings, too. I've talked um, largely about physical setting. But the other part of world building is society. And again, your core idea really constrains that. One of the basic questions is who has power in a society? And you can break that down further and ask who has political power, who has economic power, and is it the same group of people? Related to that is the question of hierarchy and status. Are the, are the people who are revered, who are up in the hierarchy, actually the ones who have status or not? Allied to that is how many groups are there in your society? You often see, in science fiction anyway, um, monolithic societies. Even the most uniform terrestrial societies have groups that don't fit. Uh, and it's really important to kind of remember that while you're writing. Even if you don't use that, even if your characters are part of that you know, majority group, it's important to remember that there's not everybody agrees. It's an easy way to add a depth and a richness, or a reality, to your worlds. Plus, it's a good source of conflict. And without conflict, you don't have a story. It's nice to know the basis of your economy. Um, it's nice to know what your characters do for a living. Um, it's one of, one of those little minor details. But there's an awful lot of protagonists in science fiction who you didn't really know what they did when they weren't having adventures. You're having some sense of a background. Language. And here I'm in kind of two minds about invented languages. I, I don't particularly like them. And again, this is, this is my aesthetic prejudice here, pure and simple. Partly because I don't have a lot of confidence in them my, when I do them myself. And partly because I, it's, it can be so easily, easy to overdo it. You don't want to overload your reader with made up words. What I prefer to see, what I prefer to do, is use ordinary English words in new ways. Obviously this is really hard to pull off, and it, but when it's done well, that to me is kind of the ultimate goal of science fiction and fantasy, to create this illusion of reality where you couldn't possibly find another word for it. That's the only word it could ever be. And that for me is the real goal of odd languages in science fiction. Less interesting, but equally crucial, is money. And I talked about the economy. It's worth knowing how the money works. There are lots of interesting things you can do with money that shape how people relate to each other, how your characters live in the world. It's a different world when there's a nice, stable currency that everybody uses. It's completely transparent. And one where the money on the books, the money that you count in officially, doesn't actually match what changes hands in the street. The other thing that I find all of this really helpful to me in developing plot as well as character. Um, I tend to kind of spiral around uh, when I'm working on a story. I have the basic idea, maybe a, a 
vague notion of the character, then I work a lot on the world, come back to the character as influenced by the world, go back to the world with what the character needs and sort of spiral on out. The thing that has been most helpful to me with all of this is acknowledging that as you work on your worlds, you, come, you frequently run into, a contra into contradictions. You may want a class that has a great deal of money, but in the um, hierarchy that you've built up, they can't possibly. Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's part of what the story should be about. The contradictions, I find, are often very useful. Um, and I encourage you not to resolve them too quickly. Real societies are complicated. They have stress points, contradictions, places that, yeah, no, it doesn't make sense, but we do it this way anyway. And again, that adds to the illusion of reality. The text of this recording is copyright 2003 by Melissa Scott. The sound recording is copyright 2007 by Odyssey Writing Workshops.